Our next speaker is going to be Raman Vasavedran, who's going to talk about emergence of mixed electrochemical ferroelectric states, piecing together a ferionics picture of ferroelectric surfaces. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I realize that me and my 81 slides are what uh, is in the way between you and coffee, and I see a lot of tired faces after this is the third day. So I will try and keep it brief um, and just give you the gist of what we've been doing over the last three years or so at the Center for Nanoface Material Sciences at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I should mention that this is not my primary work. I'm more or less uh, kind of only tangentially related to this work. Um, I, I, if you have some very technical questions and I can't answer them, I can certainly ask the right people uh, if I'm unable to answer them. So I do apologize in advance. So we've seen a number of talks today about interfaces of ferroelectrics. And uh, I think that, you know, of course, that's very important. But one of the areas of ferroelectrics that hasn't received the attention that I feel that it can deserve is the bare surface of a ferroelectric. Because a, a number of quite interesting processes can ha happen on ferroelectric surfaces. And particularly when you start to scale down your ferroelectrics to thin films, for example, or the 10 nanometers or so, the surface electrochemical processes can actually have a very large impact on the ferroelectric phase stability. And that's what we're really looking at in this particular study. So before I start, you know, just the people who are involved in this work, of course, Sergey Kalinin kind of led it for uh, the last three, four years uh, at, at CNMS at, at Oak Ridge. Um, but I really want to acknowledge Yi Kao, who is our postdoc, uh, who is now at UT Arlington, as well as Anna Morozovska, who developed all of the Landa theory. And I think she's made some tremendous strides over the last 15 years in Landa theory of ferroelectric materials. Uh, also, so many of our collaborators, both in ORNL and outside, as well as the US Department of Energy for funding this work. So, you know, there's quite a number of papers now on this particular topic of this mixed electrochemical for electric state. They kind of came out in the last, I guess, 18 months. And so I'm just uh, showing probably the main ones here. I'm happy to send them to you if, in case you're interested in reading them. Um, you know, this is not a new idea per se. Of course, you know, everybody knows the coupling between uh, chemistry and physics in terms of ferroelectrics. It's quite important in complex oxides in general. Uh, basically, if you, try to, if you want to understand uh, ferroelectrics, you know, you could draw these simple diagrams which are based on physics. So you have these order parameters and the external stresses that uh, can modify these order parameters. But if you really want to understand them uh, in, in real devices and in, in real materials, you also have to consider the chemistry and the defect chemistry. So for example, uh, you have to modify this diagram by incorporating the electrochemical potential mu because in general when you apply electric fields, it's not just the polarization that can change, but you can move defects, you can move oxygen vacancies and so forth. And so if you want to have an understanding of ferroelectric, you really also want to have a, a good understanding of how you're changing the material chemically by applying electric fields and stresses and things. One of the major things, you know, that has been kind of, I would say, uh, it's been appreciated in literature, but more or less uh, people have uh, not thought about it that much, and that is that polarization, in order for it to be stable, obviously requires screening, right? So if you have a ferroelectric surface, you don't have screening, then what's going to happen? So um, generally, if you're in ambient conditions, you're going to have you know, species that can screen the polarization. In the absence of that, what will happen is the surface is going to somehow reconstruct um, because the bulk uh, obviously wants to stay ferroelectric. So the surf if the bulk is quite large, the energies are going to be quite large, and the surface really has to follow the bulk. And so um, we've, over the last two decades, or so have a number of experiments from Kelvin probe force microscopy to try to understand surface charge dynamics in ferroelectric thin films and ferroelectric uh, single crystals. And so you can see some quite interesting results that have been shown. For example, you can see that you can take barium titanate or other materials above their uh, TC and you can see how the surface charge is kind of inferred. You can see shadows after a moving domain wall. Um, you can also see some very interesting features when you try to switch ferroelectrics locally. For example, in this lithium nibate study, which is published in uh, Nature Physics by Anton Ievlev and co-workers, you can see they have this kind of almost almost uh, quasi-periodic structure, some interesting domain shapes can show up, and some uh, even chaotic domain switching can, uh, can occur. And all of these really require you to understand ionic screening processes on the surface. So if you want to switch the polarization, you actually have to take into account screening um, for this to occur. 
One of the greatest, I would say, one of the really good works in the last decade in ferroelectrics has to be coming out of Argonne in this particular work um, by Highland and Stevenson. And, and what they did was they took an ultra-thin th ferroelectric film, lead titanate, I think it was less than five nanometers or so, and what they did was they put it into a chamber and they changed the partial pressure of oxygen you know, at, at slightly higher temperatures. And what you clearly see is that by simply switching, uh, by simply changing the partial pressure of oxygen, they're able to induce ferroelectric switchings. You see this nice butterfly hysteresis. So without applying any electric fields, they're able to switch their polarization. So this obviously has something to do with screening on the surface. And so they did some uh, calculations and so they did the initial thermodynamic treatment. And what they found was, you know, for this particular thickness of, uh, of lead titanate, there is either one, there are different states of polarization that are preferred under different partial pressures of oxygen, right? So this is exactly what they saw in experiment. Um, this is also relevant, for example, for so-called charge collection microscopy, and so I can point to a review. Um, that's kind of work uh, that's, again, happened from Argon and Sung Bom Hong, who's now at uh, uh, Korea. There is also some first principles calculations on ferroelectric surfaces. So for example, you can see that depending on the polarization orientation in your, in your ferroelectric, you'll have different types of surfaces and, and different types of surfaces will be stable. So you'll have different reconstructions. So I'll just point you to one work here with lithium nibate. And so obviously you have this kind of very complicated phase diagram depending on your electrochemical potentials involved. But the gist of it is this is basically that if you don't have screening from external charges, your surface should reconstruct and this reconstruction is going to depend on the polarization orientation, obviously. And so that's kind of what's shown in these two studies, um, in this case for lithium nibate, in this case for lead titanate. So we were, you know, if you look at bulk ferroelectrics, you can pretty much write Landau expansions and you can pretty much predict properties pretty well uh, with current Landau theory. And so you can, you know, go ahead and add these terms. And in general, you don't have to worry about the surface so much because, as I said before, the bulk polarization energy is so much higher that the surface really has to follow whatever the bulk does. And so it's not so important when, you, when you're looking at single crystals to be able to look at these effects. But we're in the thin film session, and of course, when you go to 30 nanometers or, or thinner, what we find is that the surface electrochemical processes become on the order of the same energy scales as the bulk polarization energy, and so you have some very nice mixed states that form, which I'll, which I'll get into in the next few slides. So how do we actually try to model this? So we take our standard ferroelectric equation of state, which is kind of shown here, right? So this is just the standard ferroelectric equation of state. And, and we don't do anything to it. We don't add any terms to it. All we do is we change the boundary condition. So the boundary condition now is instead of the electronic screening boundary condition, you have a chemical boundary condition. And so that's kind of given by the surface charge density here. It depends on the applied potential, which is obviously has to be solved self consistently. Uh, it depends on the, the charge of the ion and the, and the, and the uh, area of the ion. And it kind of follows, we, we say that it follows an absorption isotherm. So what this means is that the surface charge density is going to depend depend on your uh, pressure of oxygen in the chamber, for example, as well as this delta G value, which is the energy of formation of a surface ion or defect. And so uh, you, can, you can think of this here, that this is the surface charge. As you change the pressure, you're going to change the surface charge density, right? So Anna that go, uh, went ahead and calculated what it should look like for barium titanate under different thicknesses. So in the case here, uh, you can see the phase diagram for barium titanate under ideal screening, right? So this is the general case, which everybody already knows. You have at high temperatures, oh, it's a bit hard to see. So at high temperatures, of course, you see that it's uh, power electric, there's no polarization. As you go to lower temperatures, of course, you, you start to have, an, you know, two polarization states to equal in energy. So it's entirely symmetric. And there's nothing very interesting happening here. This is what everybody has, you know, seen from 50, 40, 50 years ago, at least. You can also introduce a dielectric dead layer. Uh, this is basically just a, a finite thickness over which the potential will drop to the external applied potential. It doesn't change the calculations at all. Um, basically, you have a slightly reduced polarization, uh, but there's nothing uh, qualitatively different about these two cases. But now, let's look at the more interesting case where we have this uh, electrochemical boundary condition. And so you can see this here. At high temperature, of course, it's parallelectric. You see nothing. At low temperature, you see in this case, there is a polarization that's stable here, and there's a polarization stable here, so that checks out. But in this intermediate range between 200 and 600 Kelvin, you can see that there's a large 
uh, region where there's only one stable polarization state. So this is what we call the mixed electrochemical ferroelectric state, and, and the reason, or the so-called ferroionic state, and the reason we call it this is because in this case, the stability of the ferroelectric phase is more or less determined by the surface ionic uh, uh, species that are, that are present. So depending on this value of delta G, uh, you're going to get slightly different polarizations, right? And that's exact, in fact what you would expect uh, if you have a mixed electrochemical uh, boundary condition. Um, condition. Also, if you want to make sure that this is self-consistent, you can do this as a function of thickness, and what you find here is that for thinner films, your, your region of this mixed state is very large. As you go thicker and thicker, the surface becomes less important, and you find that this width of this mixed region is actually rather small. So this kind of agrees. It's kind of a sanity check almost. But it's a little bit hard for us to you know, physically change these delta G values. Of course, you can't do that because it's kind of given by nature. What you can do is apply voltage. And so apply a potential. Let's see how these phase diagrams change under applied potentials. So in this case, again, ideal screening, what do you do? You simply asymmetrize a double well potential, and you'll stabilize one polarization state over the other. And that's exactly what you see in the ideal screening case. You see that here, when you, when you apply a slight potential, one of these is, this state is favored over this particular state. So um, that's why there's an asymmetrization yeah, in, this, in this diagram. And the same thing happens uh, when you also consider this uh, dielectric dead layer. But what happens now when oops, what happens now when uh, we want to try to apply a potential for this particular state here? That's the that's the more interesting case. And so I'm going to explain to you what happens here, and it's quite interesting. So if we start with a three nanometer film, you will see that in fact at three nanometers, there's only one polarization state that's stable, and it's only at very low temperatures. But by applying potentials, you're able to stabilize all different types of polarization states here. So I, I wish this, uh, the color, I guess, is, of the laser is bad. It's kind of blending in with this, with this. But in any case, you can see that you can kind of access a range of polarizations by applying potential in this case. Um, similarly, you can do that for a 30 nanometer film, where now we've kind of recovered the for electricity here. And then for really thick films, it's almost uh, back to the standard uh, bulk for electric type behaviors. And so you can think of this more in a schematic level, where if you have a very, very thin film, you kind of lose this, uh, you lose the two states of polarization. And as you go thicker, you start to gain them, and they kind of become more well separated. You can go ahead and, and, and calculate what these phase diagrams should look like. So this is an example where Anna has calculated the phase diagram um, for 20 nanometers, 100 nanometers, and 300 nanometers of barium titanate. You can see that this is, as a function of temperature and pressure, this MFE is a so-called mixed ferroelectric state. You can see that this mixed ferroelectric state becomes less and less important as you go to thicker films, as you would expect. Interestingly, there's also this kind of uh, strange critical points that exist in these phase diagrams. One of the, I would guess, I would say, interesting finds um, from peer response force microscopy studies in the, maybe the last decade or so is that it seems that you can possibly, possibly, I should say, because PFM has a lot of artifacts, obtain a range of polarizations for, uh, in, you know, in, in, in ultra-thin films. And so the question is, what is the origin of these types of effects? Um, one of the possible origins is, 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 this uh, is explained by this particular theory. So if you look at this particular diagram, this is again, this is a 30 nanometer, in this case, a 30 nanometer film. If I change the partial pressure of oxygen, I'm going to change the, po the polarization at a given temperature. And the same thing will apply for fields. And so it's possible that by applying, but by incorporating this, uh, uh, changed boundary condition, we can start to explain some anomalous features that we've seen in local experiments with Pearson response force microscopy. How can we possibly identify some of these states? Um, so for that, we turn to a technique called uh, contact Kelvin probe force microscopy. This is basically where you take hysteresis loops, um, but instead of taking a hysteresis loop uh, and reading the piezo response at zero volts, we now read the piezo response or uh, at different voltages. So in this case, minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two. You can forget about this BE packet here. This is just a read packet. So basically, this is what's applied, and so you're you kind of reading the signal at different voltages. And so what we hope to do by this technique is to be able to look at the dispersion in the polarization states as a function of these uh, DC voltages. So if we take a standard uh, material like strontium titanate and, and uh, a thin film on dispersion scan, and this should not be ferroelectric. And indeed, when we look at this response, you can see all straight lines, which suggests that uh, this is purely electrostatic response. 
But let's, let me walk you through what this diagram actually means. So this here in, in, uh, in the bottom axis, in the x-axis, is the read voltage, or the, that, that's those offsets that I showed you before. So um, basically, they come from these uh, offsets. And so each one of these points comes from these offsets at a particular write voltage, which is given by the, the color. So if you go along this line, it actually tells you the surface potential after applying some voltage. So in this case, after we apply this uh, minus, uh, minus 15 volts, of course, this red line here, you can see you can read the surface bias, which is around minus 2.7 volts. Similarly, you can do that on the positive side. So after applying plus 15 volts, you see that the surface uh, bias is something like 2.8 volts. Why is this important? Well, if you look along this particular axis here, you will see some bunching, right? So you see some lines bunching here and some lines bunching here. And so even from a purely electrostatic response, you see this kind of hysteresis loop that, that occurs. And this is, uh, this is interesting and also it's kind of disheartening in a way because this means that if you see this ferroelectric hysteresis loop in PFM, it doesn't mean that you have a ferroelectric material. Um, nonetheless, uh, the important part here is that I want to give you an idea of how to read these particular diagrams. Uh, we also think that the reason why you see this kind of bunching is because what you're doing is you're creating some uh, dipoles, for example, either within the material or within the tip surface junction, and that's actually responsible for this type of hysteresis. So we wanted to try to see if we could measure this kind of dispersion in the, ferro in the polarization, in the ferroelectric states. And, and to do so, we were very lucky to collaborate with Catherine Duberdu, who is now in, in Berlin. And so what we found was that she grew some uh, barium titanate on, si on silicon, and she found, and, and we found that when we when we do these CKPFM studies, this is this STO on silicon. You can see it's pretty much flat. There's hardly any dispersion. Uh, in in the ten monolayer case, you can see one polarization state here and another polarization state here, and the width of this kind of reduces as you make your barium titanate uh, uh, smaller, so uh, thinner. So this is the ten monolayer case, seven monolayer case, and four monolayer case. But still, you can see that there's there's a, there's a switchable polarization at zero volts. It's kind of interesting. Um, we've also done some uh, faceful modeling on, this, on these particular uh, states, and so you can clearly uh, reproduce chemical hysteresis loops um, through the face field method when you incorporate these different boundary conditions. So I kind of point you to this particular paper by, uh, it was in PhysRev B by Yi Kao uh, very recently. So in summary, uh, I think ferroelectric surfaces can be quite interesting. I think they can obviously have some very important impact on the ferroelectric phase stability uh, when you go to ultra-thin films. And in order for us to understand this better, we need chemical imaging tools and we need more atomically resolved studies of ferroelectric surfaces uh, in order for this to be uh, kind of taken to the next level and, and really give us a nice understanding of the couplings between surface and bulk processes in thin film ferroelectrics. So with that, thank you for your time. For a few questions for the break here. Go ahead. Would like to ask uh, the, about the film strontium titanate on dysprosium scandate. So you s you claim that the polarization hysteresis loop is just artificial in this case, but you measure polarization out of plane of the film. Yes. But in the case uh, in this case the strain is tensile and the polarization should be in the plane. So can you comment it? It should be polarization in the plane there. There is also dielectric anomaly in the plane and not out of plane. So as far as I know, the, the its strain is quite small uh, on this frozen scandinate. One percent. Right. It's, it's okay. Large. Well, um, we... When we whenever we do the lateral PFM studies, we are unable to find any signal um, that would suggest an in-plane polarization is all I can say. Yes. So uh, could you measure as well in-plane polarization? Y y well, we could measure the in-plane strain, if, yes. If it, if there, exists, if it exists, we yeah. can do it, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I just want to ask, I guess, kind of obvious question about time scales in kinetics. I mean... At what time scale does the screening occur? I guess it will depend upon what kind of system, but, but can you give us some idea of the orders of magnitude? Yeah, this is a great question. So our time-resolved Kelvin probe force microscopy experiments suggest that there can be some really fast processes that occur and some rather slow ones. So, you know, it might be on the order of seconds for long, you know, for... So you could take, for example, lateral electrodes, bias them, uh, and, uh, and see the transport of, of, of charged species from 
Kelvin Pro Force Microscopy studies, and, and they clearly show slower time scales. Um, but in general, if there are faster processes, and I assume that there are both fast and slow processes here, uh, our KPFM studies can only go down to, let's say, a few tens of microseconds. So if it's anything below that, at a really local scale, we won't be able to measure it, um, not with our existing techniques. With that, uh, there, oh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you for the talk. Uh, you have shown these um, ferroelectric loops that are not, in fact, ferroelectric. Uh, is there a way of making a criterion which says, okay, this is ferroelectric and this is fake? So that's a really good question, and uh, we've written a very long review article on that topic, so I'm happy to send it to you. Um, it was very painful. <laughs> but basically, uh, what I'm willing to say here is that we know what a, a true ferroelectric looks like in the CKPFM experiment. So when I say true ferroelectric, when, when the polarization is very large, um, so PCT, barium titanate, uh, lithium nibate, we can see a clear dispersion. So we can clear, clearly see the distinction between this type of CKPFM result and what we got in the STO. Um, on a more fundamental level, I cannot claim that just because it does not show uh, this type of behavior in this experiment, that that material is not ferroelectric. And the reason for that is because, number one, there's a noise uh, problem. So if your polarization is less than two microcoulombs per centimeter square, you're not going to be able to see it. It's just a, that's the noise limit for our, for our technique. Um, the second problem is, of course, that you know, there's obviously a lot of surface problems. So PFM is surface sensitive. And so if you have some kind of dead layer at the surface or you can't switch the polarization at the surface, like happens in relaxers, for example, uh, then you might come away from this thinking that all you have is electrostatic response and you don't have a switchable dipole. Um, but that's not actually obviously the case because you're more interested in the bulk polarization and, and whether you can switch the bulk microscopic polarization. And so for that, I think what we really need is you need to combine experiments from you know, complementary methods to try to see uh, what is ferroelectric and what's not. I, I have a suggestion to try to make a decision tree-like approach um, where we can talk about it. Okay. With that, I think we'll thank all the speakers again. <laughs> it's time for a break.